So I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Steve Dawson. Um, Dr. Dawson holds a Bachelor of Engineering Metall Metallurgical degree from McGill University and Masters of Applied uh, Science and a Doctor of Philosophy degree. Um, Steve joined uh, Syntacast in 1991 as Technical Director and was appointed President and CEO in 2002. Uh, since um, uh, Dr. Dawson's uh, tenure as President of the company has become a NASDAQ uh, traded company and um, its production is now more than one million cylinder blocks per year. So without further ado, I'll um, hand over to Dr. Steve Dawson. Thank you. So good afternoon. Um, Cintercast, we are known as the compacted graphite iron people. Um, we provide the process control technology that enables the foundries to produce CGI in a cost-effective way. Um, compacted graphite iron is best suited in applications which have a simultaneous thermal and mechanical load. So it's primarily cylinder blocks and cylinder heads. 60% uh, of our business today is passenger vehicle. Our smallest engine is 2.7 liter. 30% uh, of our business is commercial vehicle. There our largest engine is 16.4 liters. And 10% of our business is off-road, so rail, construction, marine, agriculture. Uh, there our largest engine is uh, 9,000 kilograms, so a large one for a marine application. Um, that side of the business has developed very well. And as Vicky said, more than 1 million engine blocks per year currently. Uh, we're in production in 22 different foundries around the world, 12 different countries. Um, I think that uh, the material has grown up to satisfy everyone's definition of high volume, and now it's quite a common material in the industry. Seven of the top ten car makers in the world have a compacted graphite iron engine. Yeah. So that side of the business, as I said, has developed uh, quite successfully. Um, what I want to discuss is a, a new part of the business, a new product that we're developing for traceability to improve uh, process efficiency and cost efficiency in the foundry industry. And, and the interesting thing about this technology is it's, it's not CGI specific. It can be applied to cast iron foundries, to non-ferrous foundries, and, and also to larger facilities like a heat treatment or, or steel mills. And we'll see some examples of that. Sorry. Okay, so this is where it started. It's a foundry in Mexico. Uh, we started a high volume production there in 2015. And it, it does all of the normal things. So you see the, the molding line uh, here. In, in the bottom, there are two melters and a holder. Uh, they take iron from the holders, uh, from the melters and from the holder. Uh, it's transferred by forklift to three wire feeding stations. So in the central station, we make an initial base treatment, and then the ladle can go either to the north station or the south station for a fine trimming correction before casting. Um, from the correction steps, it comes to this temperature measuring platform, and then they do their normal chemistry sampling, and then from either one of two pouring cars. So it's all normal stuff for a cast iron foundry. Um, but, but it's rather busy, so we make two cylinder blocks on this line, a 50 kilogram cylinder block and a 135 kilogram block. The small one is made from a small ladle, uh, 1400 kilo, and the large one is made from a larger ladle, 1800 kilos. And there are five ladles in the run at any one time, and we tend to produce between 18 and 20 ladles per hour. So it's really a high volume production. It's uh, 10 hours per day on the CGI jobs. And as we were ramping up the initial production, it became clear to everyone, to the foundry, to us, and also to the end user, which was Ford. Both of the engine blocks are for Ford. And that the operators will get it muddled. You know, it's just too demanding for them. So the idea was um, when we base treat a ladle, we bring it out, we take the cintercast sample, um, we then say that this ladle needs uh, five meters more magnesium wire, 
and maybe eight meters of inoculant wire before we send it to the molding line, yeah, to bring it into the specification. And so that's ladle A. Maybe ladle B needs 10 meters of magnesium and 15 meters of inoculant. And we couldn't rely on the forklift driver to take the ladle to the right station, whether it's the north or the south correction station. So we simply developed a system where when the ladle arrives, he says, I'm ladle A, I need five meters of magnesium. Yeah, and we automate that. So this is the, the ladles on preheat. And you can see here that each one of the ladles has a radio frequency identification tag. It's important for them all to be in the same location. There's a close-up of the tag inside of a thermal sleeve. And then at critical points in the foundry, we put an antenna so that when the ladle passes a station, it simply reports. It says, I've been here, and it tells you at what time it's been there. Yeah. I mentioned that it can also be applied to steel mills. So, oh, sorry. And this is a photo of a steel mill that we're working in. In this, you know, they do vacuum degassing in steel mills. And there's two different ways of doing it. In the large steel mills, they'll put a, a degasser with two snorkels into the open surface of the ladle. But in the smaller steel mills that can't afford this type of technology, they put the ladle into a tank. They close the lid and they pull a vacuum. Yeah? And it's in that tank for over an hour. And during that hour, the temperatures get so hot that the RFID tag stops working. So for those applications, we couldn't have uh, the radio frequency technology, and we developed uh, an optical matrix plate. So you can see a 2D, oops, sorry. You can see this 2D code, and we have a camera that reads it, and you know, it goes uh, through all of the stations we read optically. So depending on the needs, of a facility, we can either use RFID or optical. Also in the heat treating facilities that we're working in, uh, they use optical because it goes into the bath. Um, so here you see a ladle getting ready for tap, it's sitting on the weigh scale, it has its RFID tag, and over here the antenna, so it registers at furnace tap, and then likewise it will register at each location. Um, here at pouring, the ladle is obviously lifted, so we have a redundant system just with a, um, an antenna at the bottom that measures it when it's on the roller table, and an antenna at the top. The green light shows the operators that the ladle has been registered, but not just that it's registered, but rather that every step in the process has been successfully performed. So if a ladle arrives at pouring without having reported to all of the stations, or if any of the stations it was outside of the spec limit, there would be a red light and the pouring car would be locked out. Yeah? So we just take that away from the good intentions of the operators. What happens in a foundry? The ladle comes to the temperature checking position. Yeah? It's uh, 10 degrees too cold. He should reject it. The guys at the line are screaming, you know, give us the bloody ladle. He has pressure. He gives them the ladle. You make bad castings. And bless their hearts, the operator tried to try to save ladles, and we have to avoid them saving ladles. Yeah? We should only send good ladles to the mine. So the first point that the ladle tracker takes care of is uh, process adherence. As I said, if it misses any steps, it won't be able to pour. Um, if it's outside of any of the control limits, it can mean temperature, magnesium, carbon equivalent, uh, inoculation level. Uh, again, it will be automatically locked out. Um, that was the intention of the system. Once we installed it, we started to learn so many other things. And, and therefore, it went from just being a CGI system to being applicable to other things. If a foundry taps 1,000 ladles, the foundry also wants to pour 1,000 ladles. Um, but you will be shocked at how many ladles never get to the line. And if, for example, only 950 get to the line, that's 50 ladles of, of lost money. Of course, you can put the ladle back in the furnace and you can reheat it. But when you do that, your line is down waiting for the next ladle. <coughs> yeah? um, so you can identify where these ladles are falling out. You can identify bottlenecks. And I'm sure that in a lot of foundries, um, they would save money 
to just hire one man to walk beside the ladle and call operators, come, come, you have to do this, you know, and get to the next station, hey, come and do this. Because when the guy doesn't do it, the ladle goes outside of the spec. And also time out. So for magnesium treated irons, the magnesium is constantly fading and we have a time limit for pouring the ladle. Um, first thing that we do is we automatically lock the car. So when it is approaching within 30 seconds of the timeout, typically it's like six and a half, seven minutes. Yeah? When it's within 30 seconds, we change the light to yellow. So the operator is allowed to finish pouring that mold but not start a new one, because if he only half fills the mold, he'll burn the cores. Yeah? Um, again, the foundry was really surprised at how many ladles get timed out. Um, it's a lot of money. In the end, we did the, the payback calculation for this foundry on the system. It was three months. Um, the data summary, so it's not a black box. The data from every ladle reporting to every station goes directly into the foundries, this automatic result streaming, directly into the foundry quality system. The foundry has full access to it. Um, if the foundry manager is off-site, he can view it on his mobile phone, see how the foundry is running at any minute. Um, an interesting thing came up in another foundry that we were working at uh, in Sweden, in fact, um, was ladle birth. So to determine the life of a ladle, the foundry was always uh, doing a visual inspection, but they never quite knew when they should take a ladle for relining. And they knew how many days it had been since the ladle was relined, but they didn't know how many cycles it was used for. So now we can, of course, tell them the days since the relining. We just put a, an antenna in the relining area, and when it leaves, we register that. So we can tell them the number of days, we can tell them the number of cycles, but we can tell them the number of minutes that the ladle has been exposed to liquid iron. Yeah. And then we put up a yellow light every time it comes to a station, and they should make a visual inspection. Very important for safety, what we were just talking about, lining safety. And, and KPIs, so we always set targets, these key performance indicators for either the shift supervisor or a shift team about how many ladles they should successfully pour, but we don't really have a way to measure it. And now when we set targets, we can also make a quantitative measurement to see if the operators have achieved the targets or not. And this foundry, uh, the one that we're doing in Mexico, is uh, about 4,200 ladles per month currently. And again, it was just an example, but if you tap 1,000 and you only pour 950, it's 200 ladles per month that aren't being poured. And uh, let's say that it's more than 50, in fact. Okay, so that takes care of the liquid metal side of the foundry. And again, once we started working with it, we found other benefits, and the foundry has taken advantage of those. And then the foundry challenged us to use the technology for other things, this tracking technology. And so we've started to work on this side of the line, on the sand side of the line. And this is now called cast tracker. So what we want to do today, at least for cylinder block and head, um, as a foundry is shipping, they'll make some initial machining uh, operations. Uh, typically machining locator points for the casting to go into the machining line at the OEM. And on one of those locator points, they'll put some sort of a 2D matrix code, either a dot pin or a laser code. And, and that, for the OEM, is the birth of the casting. Yeah? That's the moment that they can track back to. And what the foundry has asked us to do, and, and, and indeed the OEM, is to move that birth point back earlier in the process so that we improve the traceability of the casting. Um, and we've defined two things uh, in that. So the first one, we move now the birth point to the actual pouring of the liquid iron into the mold. And we've uh, introduced this term called inception. And the inception is when the cores are blown. Yeah? So we can now trace back uh, to the core production. Um, what does it mean for an OEM? It means that he can go to the windscreen on a vehicle, he can scan in the vehicle identification number, and he can know the minute that the core was produced. 
He can know the details of the temperature, the resin content. He knows how long they were on the shelf, what the storage time was. He knows the humidity during the storage. Um, he knows the moment of casting. And when the mold that we're tracing arrives at the pouring car, then we make the handshake with the liquid metal side. Yeah, so we move the birth all the way back to core production. Um, one thing that every foundry struggles with when they have a defect is to try to understand the root cause of the defect. Yeah? Because it's so hard to track the casting to the ladle. And frequently there will be a paper trail where the operators will mark on the paper the ladle number and they'll mark the mold number. And you know, then you have to pull together those papers from the different areas of the foundry and try to make a correlation. You're never quite sure if the correlation is strong, but every foundry will tell you that it takes us two or three days to compile this uh, uh, sequence uh, and maybe one day to do the metallurgical evaluation. And so the, met so the cast tracker now just gives you that data as a starting point. You can jump straight into the correlation. And not only do we know which ladle it came from, but you know if it was the first casting in the ladle or the third or the seventh. Yeah? Because the early castings are halter, the lower castings are lower in mag, you get different types of defects. Um, today what happens in the industry is that when a casting arrives uh, at an OEM with this uh, 2D code on it, if they have a leak in the casting, you know, there's some kind of a leak test after the machining, um, they will quarantine 24 hours of production. Yeah? So then every casting that arrives within that 24-hour date code is set aside for visual inspection. And now with the cast tracker, if you, if you quarantine something, you only have to quarantine one ladle, right? Because it's only the castings that came from that ladle that are potentially at risk. So as they go into the system and they're automatically read, if they're the 10 castings from that ladle, uh, they just get pushed out. Yeah, and I mentioned about the OEM being able to go to the vehicle identification number and have this full traceability in the process. So here we see uh, it's uh, two cores from a V6 cylinder block. And typically the foundry will make the core package, so they might blow 15 cores and assemble a package. Maybe it's manual, maybe it's robot, depends on the foundry. Um, and then they tend to leave a hole in the casting. So here's the hole. It's filled in in this picture, but imagine that as an empty hole. So they, they blow the cores, they assemble the core pack, they put it onto the shelf, and maybe within the next uh, day or up to, say, 10 days, they'll bring those out of storage and put them <coughs> into, into production. And when they bring the cores out of storage and put them into the mold, and they will typically mark a tracer core. This can be laser. The laser systems are very expensive, so most foundries use a scribing, a scratching technique. So they scratch a code on this core. Here you can see the tracker core, and they just insert it. So this is the moment when that uh, core package went into a mold, and then it will go up the molding line you know, 10 minutes later to be poured. So in a way, that can be regarded as the starting point of the traceability today. Yeah? Uh, and, and it will be marked on paper by an operator. That's the state of the art. So what we do is we take the signal directly from the scribe. Uh, it goes into the database. And then we want to trace that uh, together with the mold. So if it's a green sand mold, you can also scribe on the green sand, no problem. The, the, the key of it is somehow to identify that tracker core. And then when you close the mold, how do you know what's inside the mold? So again, we put an RFID tag on the outside of the flask. We link the tracker code to the RFID on the outside of the flask. And then we, by reading the RFID tag, uh, we know which castings are inside. Let's see a few examples. So this is the printer here. So we print a label, depending on how the foundry wants to operate. But we can print a label, stick it on, and then when these uh, cores go into the flask, we read them with a camera. So now we know that this 2D matrix code is linked to the scribed code on the tracker core that was inserted. 
Yeah, they, they talk together. So the, tra the describer sends us a signal, we make a 2D matrix code with that uh, information in it, put the sticker, or the operator just puts a sticker on every casting. Um, if the foundry wants, we can also use an inkjet, inkjet printer to make a, a code directly on the sound core, but typically we use the paper. And at this point, sorry, at this point it will go into storage. Yeah? So normally, as I said, you leave a hole there, put a piece of paper on top of it. When it comes out of the stock, uh, we put in the tracker core and that's kind of the starting point. We will put the tracker core in at the beginning and put the label on top of it. Then it goes into the storage. Yeah? Uh, if we have a foundry now asking us, can we do it for all 10 of the cores? If we have 10 cores that we put together to make the core package, and yeah, you can do that. It's a label on every core, and then the outside label would have the information of all of the 10 cores. So you can do that. We don't do it yet, but I think it can well be a next iteration. Uh, so again, this is a different block. This is the big 16.4 liter V block that uh, I mentioned earlier. So you see how they both have their uh, uh, 2D matrix code. One camera can measure the entire flask. So if there are eight castings inside the flask, the camera will measure all eight of them. And it has a capture range of about 1.5 by 1.0 meters. If, if the flask is bigger than that, you just have two cameras. Yeah. Um, and then you can see the RFID tag on the outside of the flask. So the tracker core is number 22, for example. So on this, we put uh, number 22. And then when the mold is closed, the RFID tag says I'm number 22. And we know what's inside the mold. And yeah, just three steps. And then as the flask moves down the molding line, we can put uh, an antenna wherever we want to identify where the flask is. Huh. So you've seen before the ladle tracker system for the liquid metal side, and then the flask arrives at the pouring area. We have this antenna. So now we make the handshake between the sand history and the liquid metal history, and we have a com complete traceability in the process. Sorry. Um, and then a shakeout, because the longer that a casting stays inside of the flask, uh, different properties, different cooling rates in cast iron is the perlite and ferrite content and the hardness, and therefore mechanical properties. So simply by putting another uh, antenna at the entrance to shakeout, we can say uh, what was the shakeout time. If, if an OEM finds a casting that's a little bit soft or a little bit weak, he can simply go back and see if it was a shakeout issue. Maybe the line went down. Maybe it was a Saturday night and they didn't empty the line. Yeah? And it sat in there for 12 hours instead of 45 minutes. But they don't know that today. Uh, so the data summary is quite simple. And I mean, we don't look in so much detail here. But you can see, OK, there's the core ID, which you have here. Um, you know, the production date, the production time. This is for the core uh, package assembly. And you can bring in whatever, you, as I said, the parameters from the core shooter. This is about the uh, core coating. So the density of the coating, the dipping time. It goes into a drying oven. So we've developed these uh, labels so that they can go through a 200 degree drying oven for up to two hours. I mean, that's pretty severe drying. So nobody really does more than that. Um, it has been, there, there's a drying oven temperature, so as I said, we, we're, we're safe up to 200. And it was on the shelf for seven days. Um, if they go into the database, they'll see the number of seconds, not the number of days. And then you can see when it uh, went into a flask, when it was poured. Now you get the ladle identification as well, so it goes to the liquid metal side. And uh, you can trace it all the way back, uh, the liquid metal history. So the interesting thing for the foundry industry is that they can't control it if they can't measure it. And all we're doing is providing the measurement. Yeah. In one database, the engineer can just call up a casting and, and see its total history. So it, it gives a process com a security, ensuring that every ladle did every step. You know, it didn't skip a station, otherwise it would have been locked out. And that all the limits and the, the fade clock was adhered to, and that those lockouts 
we change them from operator discipline and training to automation. Um, I, I think that this is... So the first part was about process control. The second part is about money. And people simply don't know how many ladles fall out of the process and they don't know why ladles fall out of the process. And if you know why, you can try to fix it. Yeah, again, you can't control what you can't measure. And we're providing that measurement. Um, KPIs as well, uh, every shift has a target, but nobody knows how to measure uh, whether they achieve the target or not, or at least they can't make the targets as quantitative as they would like to. Um, and finally, when we bring in the cash tracker side of it, um, this confidence for the OEM that he can trace everything. Um, and, and the foundry can do troubleshooting, the OEM can quarantine a ladle instead of a day. Um, so I think it's really neat, new technology, and uh, yeah, it can be another leg for us to stand on. Thank you.